Okay, well, thank you very much, Elaine. And I'd like to welcome everybody here to this lecture talk in the Maynooth Love Data Week series. And we're very privileged to have Leo Appleton, Dr. Leo Appleton, who's the editor in chief uh, of New Review of Academic Librarianship. So uh, Leo is going to talk and uh, we have quite a large crowd today. I think there's going to be possibly 60 of us. So I would ask you to put questions into the chat box and I'll be monitoring the chat box and I'll deal with the questions, pass them to Leo when he's finished speaking. And then after that, if you want to ask a question, make a comment, the best thing is just to turn off uh, your mute and to come in and introduce yourself. Okay, so without further ado, I'll hand it over to Leo Appleton now. Thanks, Leo. Okay, um, thank you very much, Helen, for that um, for that introduction, and um, and thanks very much also to Helen for, in, for inviting me uh, to do this um, session today in in your Love Data Week, uh, which I've entitled uh, "Tell Us What You're Doing Using Library Data to Inform Scholarly Communications." So just a, um, a brief introduction, as, as Helen said, I'm um, Leo Appleton. Um, by day, I am um, a senior teacher at the Information School in the University of Sheffield, but that's a post I've only taken up in the last year. Uh, prior to that, I was a practicing librarian, and I'll tell you a little bit more in a moment. But um, for today, and I think uh, why Helen's invited me, is in my capacity as the editor-in-chief um, for the new review of academic librarianship, so I, I, that I can speak to you, um, I suppose, as somebody who's involved in, in scholarly publishing, and we'll, we'll think a little bit about the role that data plays in that. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm absolutely de delighted to be invited uh, to present, and I hope what I've got to say um, is, is of some use to, to some or all of you who have joined us today. Um, and I think uh, the idea of uh, Love Data Week is wonderful. I'd not come across that before until until Helen invited me. Um, and I just thought I'd just probably have to kind of... Um, kind of confess that um, data is not something I'm particularly comfortable with. Um, and I think in all honesty, I probably used to shy away when anybody mentioned data or, or asked me, what does the data say or what data have you got? Um, and I think kind of, I used to always regard data as statistics and numbers and metrics um, and not really necessarily my, my comfortable space. But during the course of my career, um, I think I've probably learnt to certainly recognise and appreciate data. I'm not quite sure I'm at the love data bit yet, but you never know. This presentation uh, may well may well help me achieve that. So what I'm going to do over the over the course of the next um, half hour or so um, is tell you a little bit more about me because that that's part of setting the scene. We're going to talk about librarians, practicing librarians as scholars, and writing for publication. And the the kind of main part of the session is around how we use data in our scholarship. As as practitioners and then we'll finish with just some kind of brief discussion around where you where you might publish or where you might get started if you've not published before um, and that hopefully will bring us to the, the close of the session. So first of all just a little bit more about me. I've, I've um, un until taking up my, my post at the information school last year I've, I've worked as a, a practicing librarian uh, uh, for 25 years, largely in, in university libraries, um, but also in further education and a brief stint um, in health libraries. Um, so that spans 25 years I've had from, from entry level posts when I first started to, to fairly senior leadership posts uh, by the time I finished last year. So my, my most recent post was as director of library services um, for Goldsmiths University of London. Um, I'm also kind of the scholarship side of me. Um, I've, I've been doing quite some extensive research over the past eight or nine years into public libraries in, in the United Kingdom, um, which allowed me to pursue a passion, which was a PhD in the, the thing that I really like, which is libraries and, and the value and impact of libraries. So over, over the course of my 25-year um, my career, if you like, I've written and presented widely on many aspects of library and information services management and provision. Examples include electronic resources, space design and planning, and information literacy, um, user experience, performance measure, measurement, quality assurance, um, library staff training and development, the value of public libraries, and leadership and management. Now that sounds like a lot, That's a, a bit, that is a lot of things to have, have written and presented on, um, but but, but um, I make no apologies for that because 
um, the, you, you have to have a little bit of self-promotion in this in this world of scholarship. And, and the one I, reason I kind of featured that and, and a, a, a kind of overview of my, my career is because that becomes important um, because it's your credentials. And, and when you do write, you need to get your credentials across. Your credentials validate why you in particular, you as the individual or you as the group are writing about that thing you're writing about. So credentials are all important. So, so first message, I suppose, is don't shy away from credentials. Um, and then lastly, I've said I'm a researcher practitioner. So I've, I have always been intrigued by um, being scholarly within my practice, or I suppose informing my practice as a librarian um, through uh, through research or through scholarship and I've also been very professionally engaged. I do have a real passion um, for libraries, for the for the career I have and for the, the jobs I do. So I've been really involved in in SILIP, um, chairing SILIP special interest groups, um, been very involved in SCONL, which I'm sure you're all aware of, um, the Society for um, college, national and university libraries. And when I was working in London, um, very active in the, the M25 consortium of, of academic libraries. So that professional engagement is also part of me and part of my credentials. So we are here to talk about um, scholarship and library practitioners um, such as yourselves, um, for those of you who, who are in this session who are practicing librarians. And the first thing I want to do is, is just throw out a question to you, is, is why should library and information professionals involve themselves in scholarship? And by scholarship, I mean, so I suppose, um, contributing to um, publication or even presenting at, at conferences, um, really about telling other people what you do, as, as, as is the, the, the title of this session. So what I'd like you to do um, is everybody who's participating just the first thing you can think of if you could put that in the chat box for me just tell me why you think library and information professionals should involve themselves in scholarship um, just to let you know everyone will see what you put in the chat so the chat's there um, for everybody um, it's a little bit a, a way of, of everybody um, interacting so if people could just share with us um, for those of you who may not have done this before you'll have a chat icon at the bottom of the screen it's as simple as clicking on that and typing in um, what you think um, or what you why you think library and information professionals should involve themselves in scholarship why shouldn't we leave it to the academics so I'll just I'll just give you another few seconds as you just throw your ideas in there great lots of ideas coming through here lots of suggestions we've got uh, to share and learn we've got shared best practice uh, practice what you preach, re-evidence-based practice, that's a great suggestion. Sharing knowledge, continual improvement, um, because we're all part of the scholarly information cycle, need to participate, need to be active, more sharing, advance the profession, highlight the value of libraries, so there's, there's some advocacy there as well, a community of practice, sharing practice, sharing through learning, through doing, professional development, um, wonderful, brilliant contributions. Thanks very much, everybody. I wasn't expecting quite so, quite so many. And finally there, uh, for Michelle, walking in the shoes of the people we support. So having that, that, that shared experience with, with our academic colleagues. Well, there was no need for the next slide because I think you got them all. Um, so there's my suggestions as why we why librarians should involve themselves in scholarship. Um, and quite a few of the, the suggestions in the chat from yourselves was about sharing best practice. Um, and I've always said, um, as, as practicing librarians in whatever sector, um, we, are, we are a service sector, we're a helpful sector, we want to help. And that's not just our immediate customers and users, but we want to help each other. And I think it's, it's kind of in our nature, you know, it's part of our values as librarians to want to share our good practice and our best practice. Um, to contribute to the profession, because that's similar, it's just that sharing again. Um, people mentioned uh, professional development. Um, and the other points I've got on the slide, which maybe people didn't pick up on, was recognition. So you would share um, what you do well, what, what, what you've done innovatively, what you've done creatively, share that and be recognised for it. And the, my bottom point on this slide, create reference points for your achievements and innovations, is again, don't shy away um, from what you do. Don't, don't shy away from um, kind of 
promoting yourself or your library or your service or your team, if you're doing something particularly innovative and creative, then to capture it in a piece of scholarship and share it um, is great because you'll get the recognition. But most importantly, you timestamp what you've done so nobody else can get the recognition later on, especially if you're pioneering something. And you don't always know that you're pioneering something, but it, that's why it's probably even more important, important to, to, to try and capture it when it happens. So I'm going to go fairly quickly because I do want to make sure we've got time for questions at the end. Um, so let's acknowledge, which you all have with those wonderful suggestions in the chat, um, that we should be engaging in scholarship as practicing librarians. So what kind of publications should we therefore be writing for? What kind of things? So I've just, I, I think, I, I realise that uh, the people who are, who, are, who are here with us today are probably a mix of people who may not have done any writing yet and those of you um, who have written for, for different types of journal. So I've suggested here different types of publication that we may um, we may be drawn towards or the thing that we're doing, tell you that this whole tell us what you're doing, it might be appropriate for you to go into say a peer-reviewed journal, um, which is probably the, the, the hardest piece of writing in terms of the, the scholarship that, that we engage ourselves with, or we might think more along the lines of a newsletter, um, whether it's a, a local newsletter, a consortium newsletter, um, or the professional press. So my, my reference point for professional press is always um, SILIPS information professional, but, but, but the publication similar to that. You may simply just want to blog and you're still capturing and, and reflecting and um, time stamping your piece of work, your research, your creation, your innovation. Um, it might be appropriate that it's more of a uh, a case study or an experiential piece or a thought piece so you may you may consider a book chapter um, and you might often see calls for, for contributions to book chapters you may have an offer an entire monograph um, you may want to set out and write a whole book yourself and again our professional publications certainly again my reference point would be facet um, they're always keen to hear ideas for, for, for monographic um, contributions or it might be that you want to inform policy so you might want to write a white paper or a report based on your experience or based on your research so on the right hand side of the slide I've kind of broken down the diff those different types of, 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 of output so, that, so the left hand side is the kind of publications we could look out for and there is a, a, a bit of a variation there a bit of a variety uh, but the types of pieces um, I, I, and I won't necessarily go through this entire list, but if you've written an essay, it might be you might consider um, that might be that might make a good um, book chapter. If you've written a, a case study based on your practical experience, it might be that that's more fitting towards the professional press rather than a peer review journal. Although that said, peer review journals are full of case studies as well. So you, you have to make an informed choice once you've once you've done your writing or once you've decided what you're going to write. Um, you probably want to think about where you might publish that as well. So I want to come on to the, the reason why we are here today, because we're in a, in a Love Data Week. Again, I think it's wonderful having a Love Data Week. Um, so I really want to focus now on data, because there's lots of different types of, of writing that we can do. Um, and I'll say a little bit more about that later as well. Um, but we want to focus now on data, the data that we create as librarians um, and what... what um, what business has it doing in our scholarship? That's that's the next question I want to, to address. So again, um, you were all really good at this a moment ago. I'd like you to answer this question in the chat um, and tell me what different data do you think that library in, and information professionals collect and use either habitually or for, for, for one-off purposes? What's what the kind of data and data sets that we, we're immersed in all the time as, as library practitioners? So if I give you, um, again, another 30, 60 seconds or so, um, if you want to just um, try and capture in the chat your ideas for what's the, what are the data that we're, we're using and we're collecting. And Tanya straight away said, you should, usage statistics for everything, the scholar set, um, number of hours we teach, user metrics, catalogue metadata, usage figures, engagement metrics, resource downloads, great ideas, great suggestions. Um, so quali qualitative, so qualitative data, let me just revisit that, interactions with, with students and also quantitative data, usage statistics, Sconnell stats, good to see the Sconnell stats coming out. I, um, I was on the working party that reduced the Sconnell stats from however many it used to be, 180 to I think only to 120 questions. Um, 
but yeah, Sconnell stats are a, a kind of bread and butter to, to academic librarians in, in the UK and Ireland. So more suggestions, we've got um, circulation data, um, library footfall, class stats, how many attended, response rate in classes, so analytics from within your classes, excellent feedback after the class, um, take up of resources post the class, I really like that, thank you. Um, that's a, um, a whole sequence of data that we may get from a, from a single teaching session. Um, quality of engagement on engagement, survey feedback, workshop feedback, survey data. Yep, I think LibQual, good mention of LibQual from, from um, Mary and Michelle's uh, contributed turnaways from e-resources, all, yep, all statistics. And this is what I was saying before when I used to shy away because I used to think it was all uh, very statistical. Um, but actually, these statistics are all about our, our business, all about our day to day. And then we've got uh, need to capture experiential data as well as statistics, how the users feel and um, emotional responses. Fantastic. Thanks, everybody. Again, wonderful set of results uh, of um, suggestions there. And again, let's see how well you've done for preempting my next slide. So this is when I asked the question to myself um, whilst preparing these slides, what different data did the library and information workers collect and use? And I think you've got all of those in the, in the suggestions. Clearly, we love our usage day. So we like to know who's, who's in, what they're doing, um, how, you know, how many are in, how many different students from different faculty, different departments, how long they stay in. And then of course we have all our circulation data. So what are they borrowing? How are they borrowing? What are the trends? What are they accessing online? The turnaways, what aren't they accessing online? And then there's room bookings as well. So we can kind of start to get data about how, how libraries, use, how, how, how our users use our spaces. We've got data, I've put data about services and resources. So this is, that's the, the kind of how many, you know, the, bigger faster how many catalogue records have we got how many books have we got on the shelves how many um, e-resources but also that fits in with the budget data and how you derive value for money so you sit set, set off um, what you what you own or what you have access to against what you're actually paying for it then we have um, survey data so I've, I've, I've put all this together as quantitative data um, but again we we, we want to gauge how people um, use and perceive um, and want to improve our services. We're all very, very user focused. We are a helping service. We're very service oriented. So we want to find out how, how, how our users are satisfied or how they perceive us as a service. So we can get quantitative data from those kind of user surveys um, that we do. Um, we mentioned LibQual as well, get good quantitative data, excellent quantitative data um, from LibQual. Again, that's all about um, the perception, people's perception, user perceptions of the libraries. Um, Analytics, where we use our usage statistics against um, a, a, another metric to, to, to map outcomes and put reading list data in there. We've got social media metrics. We would we would monitor our engagement with with our Twitter accounts, with our LinkedIn's, with our um, Instagrams. Um, we, we would monitor and again probably get some quantitative data from there. And then UX, which is a fairly recent phenomenon over the last ten years. That um, that whole ethnographic approach to um, it's kind of getting student engagement and student feedback, sorry, user engagement and user feedback into our service, we can get quantitative data from there. So I, I would suggest anything you observe, you can quantify. Um, whereas we jump into the quality data side of the of the slide um, and we get the all really, it's all the things that people would say about our services. So, so, so some of those tools, um, a survey, for example, or LibQual or a UX project would give us both. It's a mix. They're a mixed method. So they give us both quantitative and qualitative data. So we'd use those comments and feedback when we run a focus group. Certainly we would use the feedback as data. Um, we probably all have comment schemes or suggestion schemes. Again, whilst they're direct comments to try and help um, develop the service, collectively they become qualitative data. Similarly, we can monitor the numbers of social media, but it's the things that, that our users say in the social media that, again, we could capture collectively and that becomes qualitative data. I've suggested other things like um, staff surveys, library user groups, critical friends groups, uh, module evaluations, national student survey. And I've consciously missed out um, UX because actually UX is all about all of those things. You could you could use any number of um, methods within, within a UX methodology um, to develop both quantitative and qualitative data. So, um, so as, as we've 
got to here, both through your suggestions and hopefully my kind of thoughts about what different data do library and information um, professionals and, and library and information workers collect. There's a lot, um, and there are lots of different types of data that we collect, um, but there are also lots of different type of scholarship and writing that we can get involved involved in and I suppose again it's about thinking about where does that data fit into the type of writing or the type of scholarship and as a practitioner and um, I've written lots of different types of, 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 of pieces I've written literature re reviews I've written opinion pieces editorials thought pieces blog posts uh, but but largely I would say mostly and um, lots of practice based and evidence based case studies um, and all of those things were certainly the case studies whether so where I feel I've been innovative or done something different in the workplace that was me time stamping the work um, kind of sharing good practice and wanting to be recognized um, for what we've done at the same time um, and I suppose I've never really been too thoughtful, if I'm honest, about what I'm putting in there as evidence or, as it turns out, as data. I've also never really been too precious about where I've, I've published. Um, and I think that's a gift that we all have. If, uh, certainly, from my perspective, if I don't, if my writing doesn't have to contribute to the ref, which as, as, as a practitioner I wasn't associated um, or recognised as faculty, so it didn't have to be. There could be actually more choosy um, about where we where we wanted to publish, and that that can mean re affect that can affect how you write. So you don't always have to write at this top level academic standard of writing. You can pitch more at the professional press, or you can pitch a case study to it to a peer review journal. Um, but I would all occasionally find myself making quite considered judgments about where to publish because of the type of thing that I've written. Um, and if I felt I'd done a robust piece of work based or evidence based research, i.e. I had used um, or I had designed a, a questionnaire or a particular intervention, I, I would then have a search for what kind of journal, what kind of library and information science journal has published this kind of material from a practitioner or an academic, but this kind of case study or this, this kind of this kind of good practice. Um, but a lot of the time I would just use my professional press. So um, the Sconnell Focus is something I'll talk about a little later on, um, which is a great channel, great quick channel um, for getting good practice and, and, and sharing best practice. Other times if I felt I'd, I'd spent, I had actually developed a research method um, and what I was reporting on um, was, was robust, I, 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 I would um, try and go for a, a peer review journal. But as I said, it's quite nice as a non-academic, um, for me it was anyway, uh, not to not or to have more choice really as to where to publish so what I want to do now is just share with you some examples of where as a practitioner um, I realize now that I've been using data in my in my scholarship and then I want to share um, some other examples of where other library practitioners have used scholarship so really now the next the next few slides are just going to be examples of, 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 of where I've used scholarship so to start with I went back um, went back in ancient history, um, which you can all see me speaking now on the screen, and you can see that photograph of me um, in 2003, probably taken in 2002, um, this fresh-faced uh, learning support advisor for health studies at Edge Hill College, but this was my, my first publication. Um, and what, 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 what my, me and my, uh, my boss, Sue Roberts, who was, who was the head of service um, at Edge Hill College, which is where we worked, um, she encouraged me to, to contribute to this piece. She'd been approached by Serials, which was the, 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 um, the publication of the UKSG, the UK Serials Group, as it was known at the time. Um, and she'd been approached because um, it, they'd heard that we were doing something innovative with, with um, e-books. And, and we, we, we were, it was quite pioneering that we were using um, e-books and we were promoting them within the VLE. So in the early 2000s, that was fairly new. So I had this opportunity to, to write. And then when I look back over this article yesterday, um, I realized, so I've put some blue arrows on the screen there, that I was lifting data from the, from the evaluation that we did at the time with the, the, the student nurses and student midwives, because that was my, that was my subject area we were using the data generated from that evaluation to inform this particular piece of scholarship so that got me thinking well maybe I have been inadvertently or subconsciously uh, using this qualitative data I am a qualitative person and um, all my all my writing career and it transpires as I have because if I move on a couple of years there's a couple of other um, 
um, articles, and I've just picked these out just to demonstrate that um, I suppose I got into quite a good habit of wherever I thought I was doing something good um, or creative or innovative, um, I would think about actually how do I capture this after it and where might I publish it. So these are two early examples of where I, I had decided I'll just approach a peer review journal and see if they see if they like my um, my papers. Uh, the first one was again, my interest then was in electronic books and in supporting health education. Again, I'd got far more this time around, I got far more student data or student, um, I suppose student perception um, of the of the ebooks. Um, and I, I, I wrote a paper about the student perspective of, of, of ebooks using again that qualitative data um, that I had pulled out of my work based evaluation. Um, I moved from when I moved from health libraries, I went into further education libraries. Um, and this is a paper called Perceptions of Electronic Library Resources in Further Education. It wasn't really widely written about in further education. Um, and this was a, 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 a slightly different example. So I used my workplace as my, my field, um, but I was also doing an MA in education studies at the time. Um, and I did my dissertation on uh, staff and student perceptions of electronic library resources in further education. So I was then able to kind of um, adapt the MA um, thesis. It's only 10,000 word thesis, but adapt that into a, a paper for this peer, peer review um, paper, uh, peer review journal, the electronic library. So again, all the time I'm using my the, the data that I'm generating in the workplace um, to inform my contributions to scholarship. And then jump on um, 15 years and I just looked at something I, um, well, I, I did record, recollect it because it was a wonderful project to be involved in. When I was head of library services at um, University of the Arts London, very creative institution, as, as I'm sure you can imagine. Um, we did this really wide scale UX project um, where we really focused on how we, how we engage our students in library planning and library design. Um, and again, there was lots of strands to this. Those of you who are familiar with UX, you'll be you'll be um, familiar with observations, um, heat maps, touchstone tours, and we did all of that as this is this quite a holistic UX project. But we also asked um, our engaged students to attend focus groups um, and keep reflective diaries. And, and these are just two examples of these rather creative reflective diaries that, that some of the participating students contributed. And again, it's only from kind of stepping back and realizing, well, this is data that we used uh, to inform our service changes, but also this piece um, that I'm illustrating on the page here, which is which is a for, for, for want of a better description for me, it was a it was a case study of um, um, a, a significant UX project that we did did across a multi site campus. So the the data that we generated helped to validate what we were doing as a as a project, and therefore we shared that as best practice. So I wouldn't say this was a research piece; it's just still sharing of best practice, but we're still using the data that we generated. And then most recently, as I was doing my uh, doctoral studies, um, I'm still, even though I'm now I suppose writing in a, those those higher um, kind of higher level um, library and information science journal. So this this piece in the Journal of Library Librarianship and Information Science from a couple of years ago. Um, and this is this is um, part of my disseminating um, my 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 doctoral studies. Um, but in this case, again, still lifting data out of the focus groups um, that I ran as part of my part of my research method. Um, so again, all that qualitative data, anything that anybody says about your service, um, whether it's um, students, library users, staff, um, it is all potentially data if you if you regard it as data um, and do some analysis on it in order to, to spot trends and, and, and create outcomes and discussion from it. So they were just a few examples. It wouldn't be fair if I didn't kind of share with you how, how I've used data or how I now realize I've used data. For me, always qualitative, but that you, you'll all be involved in, in, um, in, in quantitative data and, and, and collecting uh, statistics and, and metrics, et cetera. Um, and in a way, it's just a different type of, of, of data, but it would still inform your, your professional uh, practitioner scholarship. Um, but I just wanted to say a little bit about um, the journal that I'm now the editor in chief of. Um, and again, just again, just to share how, how, how I suppose I stumbled across uh, being editor in chief of the new review of academic librarianship. I, I first um, got involved by writing a piece um, in 2013 about students engagement and the editor at the time recognised me 
um, from having written for Health Info Information and Libraries Journal of, um, a few years previously. So he he just asked me if I'd be interested in reviewing subsequent any future papers, which I was quite happy to do. I think reviewing is is a, is the next stage on from from writing for peer review and um, for you to contribute back to that whole cycle of of, of academic publishing. Um, and then after a few, I suppose, timely and half decent reviews, I was asked if I'd like to join the editorial board. A few couple of years later, uh, would I be an associate um, editor, which then starts me getting used to being an editor of a journal. And now when, when my predecessor decided it was time to step down, he passed the baton over to me. So I am now the, the, the editor of New Review of Academic Librarianship. and delighted that I've replaced myself with, with, with our own Helen Fallon, who's the new um, associate editor of the New Review of Academic Librarianship. Um, but I've just put this list up because this is these are this these in our aims on our webpage. These are the things that we will publish about, um, and I don't need to read them out. You, I think you only need to look down that list and realise they're things I do, or they're things we do in in my library in 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 our team. And that's the beauty of the new review of academic librarianship. It's practitioner oriented, uh, practitioner focused. It's not to say we don't publish academic pieces or we don't welcome pieces from academics, uh, but we're very much supportive and welcoming of any any library and information practitioner in, in academic libraries um, who want to contribute a paper or want to submit a paper um, for review and for consideration. So it's it's one of several outlets, but I would I would obviously I'm biased, but I would suggest it's a great outlet for um, academic librarians all over the world um, to convert their practice into scholarship. Um, it's rigorous, it's robust, everything's double blind peer reviewed, um, but it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good platform for us as a, as a library practitioner community. And just by means of, I suppose, finishing this, this presentation, I've just got a few examples of um, recent papers um, that kind of fit fit the fit the bill for the messages we, we're getting across here. How they've used data in their practice um, to contribute to scholarship. So the first example I have um, is a paper by Ashcroft, Bird, Bull, Harper, James, and Robertson, um, where they've uh, written a paper based on their project to move from subject-based teams to functional-based teams. So. I'm not saying it's fairly common, but it, it, it's um, it's it's a fairly new phenomenon that we move from subject-based to functional-based teams. Um, they're not necessarily the first to do it, but the first maybe the first to do it this way. So they in this paper they present a case study, but they also present the findings from the survey of their university staff, so outside of the library, but also a survey of staff from other institutions outside of their institution, um, and that validates the data, and that's really good because they're getting data from 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 two sets they're getting data from their internally from their own university and externally um, by validating what they're what they're finding internally and they're validating that through qualitative data so I thought that was a good a good um, example to share with you the next one I have um, a paper by Anne Hayes which is a um, a paper around um, student usage in particular um, LGBTQ students usage of the library and wanting to understand um, the, the, that particular user group's needs and be responsive to that particular uh, group of students. So again, very it's, it's all grounded in practice, all grounded in wanting to develop and improve services. Um, but in this, Anne has used a survey technique and in that survey she's, she's um, generated quantitative and qualitative data, um, which has helped to, to then inform um, the changes that she may have made to her service. It informs not only that, but it informs best practice and scholarship because she's then gone on to publish it in the new review of academic librarianship. Um, another one here, uh, again, about a UX um, ethnographic research project at the University of York. And again, Michelle and Vanya, when they wrote this piece, um, um, had some quite thorough open interviews with lots with their academic staff in order to un understand their needs and develop services. Again, they've converted this into a piece of scholarship to share that method and share that best practice. And then I thought I would um, tease out some recent um, Irish contributions to the new review of, of academic librarianship. So there may be some um, familiar names here. We've got a piece here um, from uh, Michelle Dalton, Alexander Kukar, and Martin O'Connor. Many voices building a biblio bi bibliog bibli blogosphere in Ireland. I've said that wrong. Um, 
and this is a great, this is an example of a collaboration. So we've got three different universities here um, who've, who've come together to evaluate um, a particular um, question they've got. Why do Irish-based library and information professionals blog? Um, and they've, they've generated data through open surveys to inform their inquiry and therefore contribute uh, to this scholarship. Another one, um, a deselection process or collection management project at, at Maynooth um, by Elizabeth Murphy. Um, and in this piece, you'll find data that's been generated from that deselection project, along with a thorough literature review, which would come as part of your um, turning your, your practice into scholarship. Um, and that, again, that helps to validate. So, so you might be validating what you're finding in your project against what you're reading in, in the literature. And again, um, suggesting here, sharing best practice in case the method that we, we used for this project is of use and can benefit other libraries around the world. And then final example, again, from our own uh, Helen Fallon and, and, and Laura Conson, um, a, 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 a small research piece where you've eval they've evaluated um, a world cafe format um, as, a, as, a, as a, a mechanism for dialogue and used the evaluation um, that they, they, they um, carried out at the end of this world cafe event, used that evaluation to generate qualitative data, um, again validated by a literature review, so what they've read about it, what other people say about this format, uh, validated by our experiences through our data, and again um, you've been able to inform your practice um, um, but also share that good practice um, through capturing it and uh, creating it into a piece of writing, into a piece of, of scholarship. Um, so we're okay for time, so I'll just probably talk for another five minutes if that's okay with everyone, and then I'll throw it open to questions. Just want to highlight places where you might publish. So some of the some of the um, publications I've mentioned today, uh, you, you, the Scannell Focus, um, you, you may all well be familiar with that, an informational pro information professional from SILIP. Um, and then there are two publications that I've recently become familiar with, um, which are Irish publications. Um, it's, this is going so well, so I'm not going to attempt the pronunciation, but the Irish Library, which I've, I've had a, a look at, and it looks like a wonderful publication, quite a hybrid publication, um, which would be a great platform for, for, for publishing case studies um, and publishing those kind of local projects and, and sharing that good practice. And then there's the, um, the Journal of the All-Ireland Society for Higher Education, Again, you can get into a bit more detail, um, so in, into, a, a, I suppose, more specific case studies, more specific discussions in that particular journal. There's my own new review of academic librarianship, um, but there are other, um, I would say, practitioner-led um, peer review journal, so we don't just need new review of academic librarianship. Uh, the Journal of Information Literacy has a very similar ethos and similar values to, to new review of academic librarianship, as, done, as does library and information research. Now they're both um, run by special interest groups or published by special interest groups of SILIP. Um, so the, um, they are both open journals in that respect as well. And then two journals that have been good to me over the years, Health Information and Libraries Journal and Insights, which is the, the, the new version of, of UKSG's open access publication. They're, they're just a few, a few suggestions of places you may approach to get started with. If you've not written for peer review before, there's some good suggestions for um, academic librarianship oriented peer review journals. And if you've not written at all before, but want to get started, then some of those professional publications may be, may be where, where you would want to pitch in the first instance. Um, I, I just wanted to end, no, just two things to end with. One was, um, I, 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 I couldn't do this presentation without sharing these three resources. And I'm gonna assume that these slides will be made available um, to everybody after the event. Um, there's three particular resources I always suggest to people who want to get started in, in writing for publication. One's the Thing Explainer, which I'm going to tell you a bit more about in a minute. Uh, the second one is the Academic Writing Librarians uh, blog, which, which Helen runs, Helen um, Helen Fallon runs and that's full of excellent insights and, and tips about how to get started in, in writing and, and how to write for publication. And then there's a similar uh, resource called Writing for the Professional Press uh, which has been written by Anthony Brewerton uh, some years ago, Anthony Brewerton's at um, University of Warwick. So I recommend just having a look at those if you're interested in writing for publication. I'm just going to dwell slightly on the Thing Explainer which is Emma Coonan, um, formerly of the University of East Anglia. She basically put this really neat um, template together 
for um, what to write about. She's called, she called it the thing I did. This is the thing explainer. Um, so bear in mind the presentation of this, of this um, sorry, the title of this presentation is tell us what you did. This is a great way of telling us what you did. So you start with um, being, you know, telling us about here's the thing I did and this is why it needed doing. So that's the introduction. Um, here's what other people said about this thing that I'm doing, um, i.e. what the literature said. Here's how I did it. What did you actually do, the method? Here's what happened. So this is what I found. And this is what I think it means. And that's the discussion. And that, for a piece of um, scholarship, potentially academic writing, they're the five things you need. Here's the thing I did. Here's what other people said. Here's how I did it. Here's what happened. This is what I think it means. If you add those other things at the bottom, abstract, background, scope, ethics, and a conclusion, um, you're well on the way to actually a, a, an academic publication. And I just wanted to share that because I think it really simplifies um, how you can write about your practice um, and your good practice um, and capture it in, a, in, a, um, in that kind of reflective but also evidence-based way. And that's the end of my uh, presentation. Um, there are all the references that I've um, made reference to throughout the presentation. Obviously, they haven't actually informed my presentation because I've used them all as examples. But if you're interested in following up as examples, which we know have got some some kind of data in them, practice-based examples, um, then please uh, please do follow that up. And just the, my one final word, uh, because I haven't covered it in a slide, largely because I don't feel qualified and don't have the credentials to credentials to, to go into it in any detail but you're probably interested in if we're talking about data and um, in in gdpr and ethics um and of course if you were doing a piece of formal research approved by your university it would be ethically approved it would go through an ethics committee and there'd be a whole process quite rigorous um for, for that um and gdpr it is different in that it's, it's data protection law that applies to businesses that collect, store and use data belonging to citizens. But for us as practitioners, library practitioners, the data we're collecting is data that tells us about our service and what other people think about our service. And we're using it, we would always use our data for the greater good, I hope, uh, to improve and develop our services. So we need to bear in mind both GDPR and ethics without necessarily having to go through formal ethics approval. And, and so when you're collecting data, if you're doing an evaluation or you're doing a survey or an interview or a focus group, you just have to be clear about why you're doing that and why you're collecting data. And most importantly, what it's going to be used for. So you get permission from anybody involved uh, there and then. And that becomes informed consent. Um, and that, that ultimately, hopefully, would, would mitigate any potential for, for kind of ethics ethically dubious linkage later on. Um, but we could probably talk about ethics and the impact of, of, of data collection on GDPR um, at length. Um, but as I said, it's not necessarily an area I'm an expert in. So I didn't want to dwell on it too much, but thought I should make mention of it. And that is the end of my presentation. So um, as I think it's gone according to time, so it should leave some uh, some time now for questions. So I think Helen said she's gonna, going to chair the questions. Um, if you've got them, uh, do put questions in the chat. Thank you very much, Leo. So while we're unsharing the screen, if anybody wants to put in a question or when we get, we're now back to the main group, there aren't any questions in the chat box as yet, but the reason for that is that people have been so um, mesmerized listening to you, Leo. That was absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much. Oh, you're too so kind. It, could I just ask if anybody wants to ask a question, could you just unmute and say your name and uh, give us your question? Hello, uh, Helen, hi, it's Michelle Breen here from the University of Limerick. Thanks very much, Leo. And, hi, Michelle. Uh, we admire Maynooth for all that they're doing to keep our CPD on track this year. It's, it's not easy, but so thank you for that, Helen. Um, Leo, my question is about, um, you've already alluded to ethics, and sometimes I get kind of snared up in the, the whole idea that, that I should have gotten ethical approval or ethics approval before I take the very interesting work we're doing and, and write it up. And, and just will you comment on that a little bit? And I'm not looking about for loopholes or ways around it, but just good practice if I go to the likes of your journal or other outlets to publish, um, please. Yeah, no, sure, Michelle. And it is, it's a, 
it's a, a, a strange situation. I'm sure if I look back over some of those examples I've I've shared with you, um, where where I've maybe used qualitative data from um, a, a, a an exit survey, which would have been anonymised in the first place. It's just asking asking students to tell us what you think about about a particular about a particular resource. Um, unless I'd have put on that. Um, the, the bit of paper or the information that this data will be used to inform something then there's there's the, there is no permission there and i think the the only uh, and yet yet you i i still would argue you could use it as, as qualitative data because there's no that the, the doesn't it's not personal data and it can't be traced to to, to any any particular individuals but i, I do think if it, with a, with half an eye on maybe ultimately always publishing something um, just just to have a catch-all on your um, surveys on your um, when, when you're engaging students in a, in a UX project um, when you're asking people for comments um, that, that you could put um, make mention of this data um, or, or what you write on this form will be used to help improve services and may be used to share be best practice so I think you've just wherever possible try and try and cover yourself obviously if you've got if you're running a focus group or you're with an individual person in, in an interview or, or getting feedback on a face-to-face -face basis again it's about um it's about being clear at the outset what what you're going to do with what they tell you and, and i appreciate that as practitioners you go into those um encounters with students with the, the sole purpose of improving the service if you haven't thought about i might write this up afterwards so it is it is tricky uh, michelle but um i do think you're you, what you're doing is when you write for the new review of academic librarianship you're sharing your best practice you're, you're sharing your experiences of um that particular project or that particular um intervention and and you're supporting it with data that was generated from it Thanks, Michelle. Thank you. And Michelle and her colleague, Kira McCaffrey, have actually published a new review of academic librarianship. Yes. Um, thanks. Um, anybody else just unmute and give your name? Hi, this is Helen Farrell from uh, Maynooth University Library. Um, thank you very much for a really interesting talk, Leo. Um, I hope this doesn't put you on the spot too much, but I am actually curious at a personal level what you found the biggest challenge for yourself was getting started on writing. Thanks. Uh, yeah, no, that's a great question, Helen, and uh, I, 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 I'm something I'm comfortable with, so it's better. <laughs> uh, very happy to answer. The the the. I, I think when I when I did get started, I was um, probably quite naive, and I don't think I really appreciated the robustness of the peer review process when when I was when I was submitting for peer review, um, and it, it, it also in a way I, it, that that helped me because when I got my peer review comments back telling me how awful the first version was, um, I, I wasn't really bothered, and I just thought, oh, well, I'll do what the experts are telling me to do. Um, and 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 submit a revision and so that's what well, whilst it wasn't a challenge but it was i suppose it was getting used to that so having your work critiqued and reviewed and then um you, i mean we, i always try and teach um or ask reviewers um to praise the article as, as well as critique it or criticize it we they need the criticisms um so they know how to improve the article um but we need to wrap those critiques up in 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 highlighting what's good about the article um, so that's that's a challenge once you start with the peer review. But the biggest challenge that I have still now is is just finding time. In fact, that's become a bigger challenge. Um, the older I've got, the more children I've got, um, that kind of thing. The more responsibility I've had. So time um, time is tough. So I really make I make a concerted effort to try and attend. I actually try and attend a writing retreat every week now, um, at least two or three hours. Um, my institution, Sheffield's brilliant for doing online writing retreats during during lockdown um, and various parts of the university. So the library is one of them and a couple of research institutes. They all do writing clubs, writing retreats. Um, and I find them I find them just useful. I put that in my calendar. It's undisturbed time. So I know I'm going to get two or three hours a week to write whatever I'm writing uh, because otherwise I wouldn't write. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Helen. Um, 
Yeah, uh, anybody else, uh, if you want to give your name and your question. Helen, can I come in there? Yes. Uh, hi, Leo. Thanks a million. And to colleagues a minute, their brilliant program and really interesting talk. Uh, Leo, maybe picking up on uh, Helen's last question, that maybe slightly more personal approach. I'm interested in your experience as a senior library leader and using data for those some of those internal conversations or agenda setting internally. Have you kind of found that useful, particularly when people might not understand what libraries do, but data is something that they might be more used to uh, uh, thinking about? Uh, have you any kind of uh, insights on uh, using that sort of data for that kind of strategic um, work internally with your internal stakeholders? Uh, absolutely, Joanna. That's a brilliant question because um, in a way, when if, if you're involved, I suppose at any any level of the of the academic library, where, where whatever data you're collecting, you, you're doing it to have an impact. And I would always use the question, well, why are we collecting if we're not going to do anything with the data that tells us value for money on electronic resources? Why are we bothering with it if we're not going to do anything with the data that tells us how many chairs we've got in the library? Which is you have to report that to Sconnell. When well, we, we've got to make that useful and impactful for us. So I, I would always inform inform anything I wrote to my seniors um, in, in, in the libraries I've worked in would always been informed by both statistical data and, and qualitative data. Um, and, and interestingly, um, I, I've found that, that actually as a practitioner making a case internally can actually be strengthened and validated if you can point to some publications that you've had in that field based nice. on data that you've generated from that institution. So um, I would I would just make the mo it, just use the data for as much as you can. Yeah. Um, yeah. I like that idea of actually referring to your peer reviewed publications because it's yeah. demonstrating again that sense of the sectoral uh, expertise that you're bringing to the table and that it's uh, data informed like every other academic discipline, which. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Grace, thank you, Leo. Really enjoyed No problem. That. Thank you, Joanna. Um, anybody else? Did you say your name again? We're actually now at 10 to 1, so we'll be wrapping up shortly. So maybe I will ask a question. Well, first of all, can I say something which really struck me, many things struck me, but don't shy away from credentials and recognition. I really think as librarians, we have to do that. We have to tweet about our work, etc. And to be honest with you, I, even I found that difficult to do, you know, the kind of, you feel a bit like, oh, see my latest article at, you know, whatever, and you feel a bit like you're blowing your own trumpet, but we do have to do that or we will get left behind and we also have to be in the view of our research offices in the university and we need to have um, ORCID IDs etc. So that's just an observation and I'm glad you mentioned that we need to get loud. In fact I think that yes. librarians get loud was the title of something or other. It might have been something you're involved in even yeah. Leo. But I wanted to ask a practical question. Many of us in Ireland started off writing for An Laurelan which comes out twice a year and a uh, Sconal Focus. Um, and really we haven't heard of Sconal Focus in a long while. I, I, there's different stories about what's happened to it. I don't know if you have any insights, Leo, or is there any way we in Ireland can help to, you know, revitalize it or whatever? Yeah. Um, no, no, the, la the last I heard, Helen, was it was, it was just, it was, it, it's not gone away, but it's but the, the, they've not um, worked out how it's going to move forward. So that's that's the last I've heard. But, it's, but that's been the case for about a year, um, and I did just double check. So I think the last, but they they, they did publish um, an issue last year, early last year, I think. Um, right. um, but it's 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 been a go to for me throughout my career. Um, it's a, it's a it always had a wonderful format. Um, and I just wonder, it probably is just worth individual inquiries to, to the Sconnell office um, to ask where it's gone, because um, it's a place I always encourage people to start off with. So, yeah, no, it would be good. And it, but yeah. it's great to also see the other resources you highlighted. Now, I have a few people I want to thank and then we'll finish up. Um, well, first of all, I have to thank Leo for a really excellent uh, talk, which I think we've all gained so much from. So thank you for that, Leo. Oh, it's a pleasure. Um, I want to thank Elaine Bean, our events manager, for uh, all the work behind the scenes. And I want to thank Fiona Morley, who's brought us a wonderful Love Data Week. And I want to thank all of you in the audience for coming 
uh, at lunchtime. So hopefully you'll have time to get something to eat now. So bye for now. And um, thanks again. It was great. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks, and thanks, Leo. Great talk. Okay.